Good afternoon and happy Thursday, everyone. It's my great pleasure to host today's Global Market and Taste Pure Nature update. For those of you I haven't yet met, I'm Leanne Marsh, Global Market Innovation Manager for Beef and Lamb New Zealand. And I'm one of six who work within the market development team here. And I'm zooming in with you all today from my home office in Auckland. Today's session will run for approximately 60 minutes and our aim is to keep things short, sharp and engaging. We have three fantastic speakers today. Rick Walker from Ansco Foods, Harry Ramsey from Crafted Communications in the US and Michael Wan from Beef and Lamb New Zealand. In terms of format, each speaker will have 10 minutes and you'll have the opportunity to ask questions at the end of each session. If there's time towards the end, we'll open up for questions for all three speakers and I'll be encouraging everyone to provide succinct answers so we can get through as many questions as possible. For those of you not already familiar, you can easily send us your questions using the chat functionality. At the lower right hand corner of your screen, you should be able to locate a box. Just type your question straight in there and hit send. Please join as guest and type in your name. If you can't see your chat window, click the speech bubble located on the top right of your screen. We'll also be recording today's webinar. So if you happen to experience any connectivity issues or the dog was barking a bit too loudly, you can rewatch over a cup in your own time once we send out a link to the recorded session, which will be over the next few days. As the title of this session suggests, we'll be providing an update on the red meat sector's global origin brand, Taste Pure Nature. Taste Pure Nature is, was created by the industry a few years ago to create awareness and drive consideration for grass-fed beef and lamb from New Zealand. The sector launched Taste Pure Nature in the California market last year, and it's been really exciting to see the traction it's gained in such a short period of time. And if that wasn't exciting enough, this year, Beef and Lamb New Zealand's market development team, alongside processor partners, launched Taste Pure Nature into China. So today, you'll hear about the progress we've made in the past 12 months and plans for the year ahead, both from a marketing and a processor viewpoint. So without further ado, let's get into things. So first up, we have Rick Walker, General Sales, General Manager of Sales and Marketing for Ansco Foods, joining us from Christchurch. Rick will share his perspective on the market during this unprecedented COVID-19 period, the benefits of the Taste Pure Nature program and what success look like, looks like. Rick joined Ansco in 2017 and is responsible for sales of the company's portfolio of beef, lamb and processed food products through their global sales network. This also includes Anco, Ansco's renowned brands such as Angel Bay, Mimoa Lamb, Ocean Beef, and Greenstone Creek. Rick spent 20 years in the New Zealand dairy industry prior to joining Ansco in a variety of government relations, ingredient sales, and key account management roles based in New Zealand, Australia, the Middle East, Europe, and North America. I also know that Rick trains for and competes in sporting events. And of course, eating red meat, no doubt, is one of the secret ingredients to success, right, Rick? On that note, I'll hand it, hand it over to you. Thanks, Leanne. And, and you're right, yeah, absolutely. Protein's an important part of my diet. And um, I think it's fair to say that uh, over the last two and a half years that I've spent at Ansco Foods, uh, if not the quantity, certainly the quality of, of beef and lamb that I've had the chance to consume uh, has increased. And uh, my two 14-year-old daughters would probably tell you that I, I eat too much of it. And, and I tell them they don't eat enough. Uh, and I guess that's a microcosm of the, the global debate that we have as an industry. Uh, and, uh, and perhaps they don't listen to me. So perhaps I need you and, and Nick and Mike to, to come over for dinner with your Taste for Your Nature hat on and uh, you can try and educate them. But um, thanks for the invitation. Uh, it, it's great to be part of, uh, of the session and uh, great to hear that so many people are out there uh, watching and listening, uh, which I think is um, uh, a credit to Taste Pure Nature in terms of the interest that's out there in the farming community about what you guys have been doing at Beef and Lamb New Zealand. Uh, and I think it's really important that we're talking about it because there'll be different views as to, as to the merits of the program and what we're doing. And, and it's really important that farmers are engaged and, uh, and are willing to, to be part of the conversation, ask the right questions and, and demand the right answers. So, so I'm, I'm very happy to be part of the, the conversation today. Um, you know, I think you know, I'm just the warm up act. Uh, and so, you know, we'll get straight into it. And, and, and the objective here is really just to give you a very high uh, level overview of, of what's been going on uh, from a processor's perspective uh, and what's been going on out in the markets and, and how we see things moving forward. Uh, so uh, without further ado, we'll get stuck into it. Uh, I guess, um, firstly, it's probably important to look back a little bit. Uh, obviously, the last three months have been pretty, uh, pretty interesting from a processor's perspective. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, from my perspective, I think I could you know, very safely argue that, 
you know, ANSCO and, and the wider processing sector in the red meat industry uh, have weathered the storm of the last three months extremely well uh, and, and should be very proud of the way that they have uh, managed to, to get through uh, what has been a very difficult time. And I think if you ask Pete Conley, uh, who's, who's our CEO, I think the thing that has probably been most pleasing from his perspective has been the level of collaboration that's happened between the processing companies uh, with everyone focused on the right things, uh, which has been number one, looking after our people, uh, making sure our people could operate safely. Uh, number two, you know, making sure that we, you know, we played our part in, in ensuring that there was a safe uh, food supply chain servicing our domestic market and, and playing a role in, in terms of looking after our wider communities. Uh, and then thirdly, you know, doing our best uh, to, to continue to engage with our export markets and customers, uh, albeit in, in very uh, challenging um, conditions. And certainly, you know, it was, was challenging during that period. And, and I know, you know a number of farmers on this, on this call would be nodding their heads because that, that challenge that we faced from a processing perspective in terms of managing social distancing and the impact that had in our throughput certainly flowed through you know, behind the farm gate too. And, 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 I, and I certainly appreciate all the patience and understanding that we had from our suppliers over that period, which, we, you know, which was difficult for all of us. And certainly financially, you know, a, a huge impact on our business uh, across, across the board. Um, yeah, but I think yeah, the silver lining of that period was that uh, you know, that lack of throughput actually gave us a little bit of breathing space to understand better what was going on out, out in the marketplace. It was such a dynamic period and still is. Um, that, and, and during that period, you know, we usually are going full noise. You know, we're really cranking it out in terms of livestock uh, and we're really you know, moving very, very quickly from a sales perspective. So having a little less product to move gave us a chance just to get our heads around, well, what does this actually mean? So you know, when we did move back to full throttle uh, over recent weeks, uh, yeah, we were better aware of the implications um, that were playing out in the key markets and, and better able to, to, to move uh, and, dare I say it, pivot. Pivot is one of those words that I'm not sure, uh, Kerry, if you see that in America, but in New Zealand, you, you can't talk for more than five minutes these days without saying pivot. Pivot and COVID-19 go hand in hand. Uh, and I get brownie points every time I use pivot uh, from my CEO. So, uh, so we've been yeah, having to really pivot between markets and customers. Uh, and, and that you know, breathing space before we moved into full speed again probably gave us the chance to do that better uh, and to manage our way uh, through things. Uh, obviously, you know, the major implication experienced to date in terms of market disruption has been you know, the massive spikes we've seen in terms of retail demand for beef and lamb across the world, not just in New Zealand, but all of our major markets. And likewise, pretty much you know, the global disintegration of food service, particularly you know, that restaurant trade. Uh, and that, unfortunately, is going to continue to be a trend that you know, we see playing out for the balance of this year you know, and potentially well into 2021. Now, now what's the implications of that? You know, from a food service perspective, you know, the, the key thing for us has been you know, product mix and carcass utilization. So in food service, you know, a lot of the high value cuts, both from the lamb side of things and also on beef, end up in that food service channel. Uh, and so with that food service market pretty much disappearing for us, it's meant that you know, we've had to take a real hit in terms of profitability in that channel, uh, either in terms of having to, to move those higher cuts at lower prices, uh, or even in a worst case scenario, giving up on those cuts altogether. Uh, and that means you know, either putting it in the freezer, which from our perspective is, is, is the last thing we wanna do, or soaking those higher value cuts, cuts up into, into some of our manufacturing commodities, which is far from ideal, um, but has enabled us to make sure that we've been able to keep that supply chain moving uh, and, and able to keep the cash flowing through our business. So, so some real challenges there, which you know, I think we're, you know, we're going to have to keep on managing you know, very, very closely uh, as we move forward. Uh, so, so as we do you know, look ahead, you know, even in the short term, you know, for the next three months, you know, for the balance of the year, uh, you know, I think it is important to remember, you know, even though it, it feels like you know, we may have broken the back of this thing here in New Zealand, uh, it is absolutely not the case around the world uh, and in our key markets that buy our beef and lamb. Uh, and in effect, you know, COVID-19 is, is unfortunately going to be the proverbial gift that keeps on giving. Uh, and I think you know, what we've seen over the last couple of weeks uh, is a very useful reminder of that uh, in China with, with the outbreak that we've seen 
uh, in Beijing. Uh, and I think uh, it also presents an interesting test case uh, of what we may see in other key markets around the world. You know, when you look at Japan, when you look at continental Europe, uh, they've done very well to start opening up their, you know, their, their restaurants. They've done well to, to allow people to get back and, and, and enjoy life again. Uh, but that brings significant risk. Uh, and, you know, I think we all have to be prepared for second waves. You know, you, you, you hear the reference to second waves. Yeah, you know, without that vaccine, it, it's going to be, you know, you, you know, we're working on the scenario that there will be second waves of this thing hitting these key markets that are potentially just showing signs of life right now, but which may come back crashing back, back to earth over the next six months or over the next 12, 12 months. And then you look at North America and, you know, Kerry can talk to it, you know, later on, but, um, you know, they're struggling to get, get hold of their first wave, let alone, you know, worrying about the second wave. So, yeah, this is a real issue uh, that we're going to have to face. And as a result, you know, if there's one word that sums up the balance of this year, it's going to be volatility. Uh, and I've been involved, um, you know, Leanne mentioned, you know, I spent over 20 years selling New Zealand dairy products in the last, you know, two or three years selling New Zealand beef and lamb. Uh, and so, you know, I've been involved with, with agricultural markets, export markets for you know, quite some time. And, and I don't think, you know, I, you know, I can't remember a time where I look six weeks out, let alone six months, and I really have no idea uh, where our markets and customers are going to be uh, and, and thus where our pricing is going to be. Uh, so so if, you, if you've come, if you've joined this forum on the hope of understanding what the price of a French racker or a tenderloin is going to be, or dare I say it, you know, what price we're going to pay for your lamb or bull uh, over the next six months, you know, you, you, unfortunately, I'm, I'm not going to be able to help you today. Uh, it is, uh, it's something that would, um, you know, I'd be doomed to failure to, to, to make those uh, uh, sort of assumptions um, here and now. Uh, and it, it just highlights you know, just how difficult it is from a processing perspective uh, to, to keep afloat uh, in the current environment. Um, and I think you know, that, that's going to be the great test for all of the, the processing companies individually over the next three to six months is, is that you're know, really testing the robustness of their, their planning and their optimization systems uh, because decisions, you know, I know here at ANSCO, are not just being made every month, uh, not even every week. You know, they're being made every day. Uh, they're going to have to be made quicker uh, and with as much certainty as possible. Um, and so from an ANSCO perspective, you know, our approach through this whole experience um, and moving forward has been based probably uh, on a relatively conservative approach. Uh, you know, our focus uh, over the last three months and moving forward remains on managing risk. It remains on looking after our people uh, and it remains on looking after our farmers. Uh, and, and so managing risk this year is probably more important to us uh, than managing profitability. Uh, and so I think that's put us in a really, really good position as we end the first half of this calendar year, which is also the end of our, the first half of our financial year. Uh, you know, we, we've come out of the difficult time you know, in a very solid position. Uh, and when we look ahead, uh, I think our systems and our processes and our approach to this, th these challenges uh, put us in the best possible position to end the 2020 year in line with our shareholders' expectations. Uh, and and uh, and hopefully you know, our farmers' expectations as well. So that that probably paints a slightly grim picture of where things things are at and, and where things are at in the short term. I think it's you know it's important though to to finish uh, with a slightly more positive note in terms of you know where Ansco sees this thing longer term. If you take COVID aside, you know, we remain very optimistic about the long term future of this sector. Uh, and for our export markets and the demand they have for New Zealand beef and lamb. Uh, and I think there's, there's two key factors that are driving that optimism. One is the growth in red meat consumption in China. Uh, and we can't discount that. That's been something that's been sitting up there for the last you know, five years that, and, and is you know, crucially important to the success of our industry. Uh, and I think that you know, that has and only will be accelerated by that other virus that uh, that seems to have been forgotten about, which which is African swine flu, uh, and and I think you know with COVID nineteen, you know dare I say it, you know the focus rightly so of the Chinese government, as we entered this this year, moved from you know, managing an animal virus to a human virus, uh, and that probably means that the you know, the opportunity related to African swine flu has been pushed out for New Zealand, uh, and presents more and more opportunity for us to to grow beef and lamb consumption in China over the next two to three years. 
Uh, on top of that, I think there's a wider global trend uh, that we continue to see uh, with an ANSCO, uh, and that's in favor of grass-fed, safe, sustainable beef and lamb. And I think the current environment with COVID-19 is only going to accelerate that trend. Uh, and that's got to be very, very positive for our industry. And I think those two factors alone, that's, that's going to provide me with a very nice segue into Taste Pure Nature and passing it back to Leanne. But um, you know, those two factors alone would suggest uh, why we're inv investing in Taste Pure Nature uh, and why Ansco Foods has such, been such a strong supporter of this project since day one. Uh, and and why we'll, we will continue to work with Nick and the team at, at Beef and Lamb uh, to, to leverage that brand as, as much as possible uh, in the year ahead. Uh, yeah, we're actively working with the guys at Beef and Lamb now around a co-branding opportunity uh, in China with, with one of our key chilled beef accounts in China. And we're really excited about that in terms of the possibility of, of launching that later in the year. Uh, and then looking into 2021, yeah, we're also busy scoping out how can we leverage Taste Pure Nature with some of our retail partners, our key strategic retail partners in the likes of uh, Germany, for instance, uh, Canada, uh, and Tokyo, yeah, and, and Japan, where yeah, we have such a stronghold uh, in that chilled retail space, and, and where yeah, we'd love to leverage Taste Pure Nature further. Uh, because I think by, by making that investment, yeah, we ensure that yeah, we can build um, and retain you know, the premium position that New Zealand beef and lamb has developed uh, in certain markets and channels uh, over a number of years, number of years. Uh, and that in turn hopefully also provides long term uh, you know, an ability for us as processes to hopefully manage at least some of the volatility uh, that we've talked about over the last 10 minutes, uh, which in turn helps us provide you know, farmers with a more consistent yeah, and, and competitive price for, for the livestock that, that we're purchasing from you all. So Leanne, yeah, that, that, that in a nutshell is, is where we're at from a market perspective and, and hopefully that, um, yeah, that provokes some, some questions from, from our audience. That's great, Rick. Thank you so much for that. It was really insightful. Um, it's always funny when we hear about COVID-19, um, you know, with all the, the doom and gloom that's around it, there's also a lot of silver linings. And so it fills me with a lot of confidence just to hear about how ANSCO and I know some of the other processing companies as well, you know, being able to have that space to make those decisions and pivot, as you say, but also being able to be um, agile and moving fast. So, um, yeah, so hats off to you guys, because I think you've done a great job. We've had lots of positive feedback, particularly from people overseas as well, about how New Zealand's been handling COVID. So, um, yeah, well done. Okay, so I'm going to get into some questions here. Um, so thanks to all of you who've submitted questions in advance. Um, if you've got any, please pop them in. So the first one here, it's great to see the meat companies embracing Taste Pure Nature in the U.S. What do you see the biggest opportunity is? In, is it in beef or lamb and why? In the U.S. specifically, I think the, the, the huge opportunity for Taste Pure Nature and for the New Zealand industry generally is in beef. <clears throat> you know, there's, you know, we've had you know, a long-standing you know, uh, presence in terms of chilled lamb and premium lamb in the, in the North American market. And I think there are opportunities there to develop that further with Taste Pure Nature. But there is, there is a huge trend towards grass-fed, um, uh, you know, antibiotic-free, uh, um, premium chilled beef in, in both retail and food service in North America. And New Zealand is absolutely in the sweet spot. Uh, and unfortunately, I think you know, we, we are a latecomer to that market. You know, if you look at what Australia has done in that market, you know, they've pretty much cornered that market. Uh, and, and it's New Zealand's job now to, to, to really regain the high ground, if you like. And I think you know, we have a far stronger story to tell American consumers around the quality and sustainability of our beef than Australian producers do. Uh, and I think that's where Taste Pure Nature is absolutely imperative uh, in terms of us being able to leverage that opportunity, which is not just about the next six months, it's about the next six years. You know, that, that market is going to continue to grow uh, and we want to be part of it. Great, thank you. Next question. What are the attributes that us as farmers should look to incorporate into our farming systems now to capture more value? And do you have an idea about which ones are coming next? Easy. Uh, yeah, yeah, great question. Yeah, and, and I think you know, different markets want different things. Um, and so, yeah, but there are some consistent themes. Um, I think, you know, uh, antibiotic free, for instance, you know, hormone free, GMO free, those sorts of things are pretty much commonplace. Uh, and and are things that we can do very easily here in New Zealand, 
uh, and 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 to be honest, you know, actually aren't necessarily going to be worth a lot of premium to farmers because they're becoming nearly mainstream in terms of the claims we're seeing out there in the marketplace. Um, I think traceability is a huge one, uh, and again, one where New Zealand, you know, can can really lead the field. You know, we've probably been a bit a bit lax in terms of our ability to really sell that traceability story, uh, and I think you know that's another one that we can really step up on and work with individual farmers and groups of farmers, as well as the wider industry, uh, to be able to, to communicate more about where their, uh, a consumer's beef uh, or, or lamb product is coming from. Great, thanks. Okay, well, that's all the time we have for Rick right now, um, unless there's a few more questions coming through, maybe just leave it for a second. Um, we will have an opportunity to bring Rick back as well to answer a few more questions when we'll have all the panelists come in. So um, yeah, so I'll just have a little look here and see what we have. Um, we've got a question here. Are there distinct, distinct export markets? Is there variance across the export markets for conventional regenerative organic meat products? I think this is quite similar to what you were probably talking about before that there's no sort of single one. Um, but is there is there anything that you're sort of seeing really clearly in terms of some of these these markets and and some of these different um, attributes? Uh, no, well, yeah, I mean, I think you know it's that it is that New Zealand story. At the end of the day, it, it's about good farming practices. It's about traceability. It's about safe food, uh, and I think you know again, COVID nineteen gives us a fantastic opportunity as a country and as an industry to really sell that safe food message. Uh, to be able to show you know, consumers what we've done to, uh, to, to get on top of this thing, to show them what we're doing in terms of the way we treat our animals, the way we look after our environment, uh, and, and really create that point of difference. You know, I think, you know, again, one of the reasons we have Taste for Your Nature is because people don't understand in our markets really what New Zealand farming is all about, and there's such a great story to tell. Uh, and so you know, the next couple of years with Taste for Your Nature has got to be about uh, being able to communicate that you know, so that you know, our consumers you, you know, just treat it like, hey, that's New Zealand beef. Yeah, we don't need to know anything more about that. We know it's going to be top quality every time we, we, we buy that from a supermarket. Great. And then a question here. How do you see the demand mix play out between demand for manufacturing beef versus prime beef over the next 12 to 18 months? If you can gaze on your crystal ball. <laughs> sure. Well, well, I guess that, you know, the key, the key with, with manufacturing beef is it is a pure commodity. Uh, and, and um, uh, and commodity markets, you know, will will breathe in, breathe out, and be driven by price. Uh, but there'll always be demand for it, one way or the other. Uh, and, and you know, and we've seen that. You know, you know, and and there's a mix with 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 the manufacturing beef between food service and retail. You know, in the North American market, a lot goes into the McDonald's of the world, the food service, you know, fa fast food chains. Uh, but at the same time, we also do a lot with, with our partner, our retail partner, Costco. So, so th there's ability to keep moving manufacturing beef uh, and, and to keep you know, finding ways of, of, of bringing value back to New Zealand. Prime is, is, is more challenging be because of the fact that it is, you know, you're focused more on those high-end cuts. Uh, and as I said earlier, you know, in that food service channel, uh, you know, that's where historically a lot of those high-end cuts have gone. So, so it is going to be more challenging on Prime, you know, there is still huge opportunity for New Zealand Prime, and uh, and we see that in China. You know, we see it in North America with with the grass-fed beef. Uh, you know, we have a very uh, strong market in Japan, for instance, which you know, we continue to see as ex extremely important for us um, moving forward. So, um, so I'm certainly not saying that the market for Prime is is collapsing and 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 there won't be a demand for our product, but it is absolutely more challenging. Uh, and that's why you know we we go and seek you know, higher prices for it too because it's a higher quality product. Uh, it, it's going into smaller uh, channels and markets, and it takes more effort to to find those homes. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, it was interesting. I was listening to Julia Jones on her NZX um, webinar with Miles um, from Fonterra the other week, and you know she was talking about how when we think about ingredients, sometimes you know we talk about commodity, but you know oftentimes New Zealand commodity products, so if it's an ingredient going into something, people are, you know, the customers are seeking a premium product, that food safety, all those things that you mentioned. So even that in itself is actually a premium, even though we probably maybe not thinking about it in terms of those, those terms, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, really interesting. Great, thank you so much, Rick, that's fantastic. Um, we'll bring you back towards the end um, in 
hit you with a few more questions, I think. <laughs> okay, great. Next up, we have Carrie Ramsey, Senior Vice President at Crafted Communications in LA, California. Carrie, I know it's 7 p.m. on your Wednesday evening, uh, so thank you for joining, uh, joining us and hello from the future. Um, hello. Carrie will share <laughs> insights into the Taste Pure Nature marketing program and the impact to date. She'll also share how we're responding to COVID-19 and what is planned for the brand in the U.S. over the coming months. Carrie and the Crafted Communications team have been working with Beef and Lamb on the development and activating of our marketing strategy in the U.S. She has a wealth of experience spanning across both B2C and B2B, including Expedia, T-Mobile, Air New Zealand, Apollo Education Group, DreamWorks Animation, and much, much more. So over to you, Carrie. Thank you, I'm excited to be here. Um, Rick, I will try to say pivot uh, at least two times in, in my slides and uh, will do you proud. Uh, I'm looking forward to sharing an overview of our US campaign thus far. Uh, as mentioned at the top of the call, uh, since launching in March of 2019, uh, we've made some very strong headway in the market. Um, we've activated a number of initiatives and partner campaigns, uh, as well as a very successful paid digital media campaign. Um, but I'll, I'll talk today about some of our most recent activity and we'll start off with a quick look at our program overview and jump to the next. So um, as we've talked about that origin story and kind of what the Taste Pure Nature campaign uh, aims to do, that core goal for us uh, is first and foremost to drive awareness and preference for New Zealand grass-fed beef and lamb. Um, as part of that, we also want to create a uh, rich dynamic partner campaigns that promote that product availability at retail um, and support the overall sales while connecting back to the Taste Pure Nature uh, initiative. And then of course that origin story, the product education piece, uh, attributes and benefits are all undercurrents of our ongoing programming. So now we'll start off with some uh, recent activity. Uh, Primarily our big highlight from last year, which was a fam trip to New Zealand with Atkins Ranch, uh, First Light and Silver Fern Farms. I had the pleasure of uh, joining that trip and uh, getting to see the country firsthand as well as meet some of the wonderful farmers and see the properties. Um, and this trip was designed to educate our attendees on New Zealand's uh, grass-fed farming heritage, uh, that product sourcing and distribution piece, and the things that really differentiate our product from what's available traditionally in the US market or what um, people might expect to find from uh, their US farmers. And this trip was really designed to lay the foundation for that deeper understanding of not only the country, but also our farming practices. Um, again, really conveying those key components of the origin story through real world experiences on the ground in New Zealand. Um, to date, our trip has resulted in almost 100 placements on social media, uh, consumer media articles, and reaching 40 million consumers. So that's people who are learning and uh, being inspired to try New Zealand's grass-fed beef and lamb. Um, that's a huge uh, impact for us and something that we've been able to continue growing. Um, and not to mention that the content that was shared during the trip um, generated 126,000 engagements. So that's likes, comments, and shares, people seeing what was happening in the market and really being uh, inspired by that and enthusiastic about it. And you know, leading that charge was the in-trip activities. Um, we developed an itinerary very purposefully. Um, we wanted to highlight the, the ranches and the farms as well as the, uh, the people working those properties and raising the animals. Um, we wanted to highlight the food and wine scene in New Zealand. Um, again, really connect it back to the end product that uh, we're, we're ultimately selling to consumers. Um, we also had some very in-depth activities uh, like attempting to dog whistle, whistle during a mustering uh, activity. I can say firsthand that that is uh, something I will leave to the professionals. I was not great at that, um, but that was just a great way to for our attendees to see, you know, what happens on a farm, what goes into raising the animals, and, and what really goes into getting them the high quality product that they can buy at their local grocery store here at home. Um, and this, this content reached 12 million people um, just in that, you know, short seven-day period that we were on the ground in New Zealand. 
And following the trip, um, attendees went home and they continued to build that awareness uh, with their own audiences through recipe development and blog posts, uh, Facebook and Instagram content, um, really providing uh, content and mealtime inspiration on the places where we know our conscious foodie consumers are spending time. Um, of note on this slide, you can see on the left-hand side, uh, the Forbes article. Uh, this is a leading consumer publication in the US and this article uh, not only referenced referenced Beef and Lamb New Zealand, uh, but it referenced all of the partners who participated on the FAM trip, as well as some very specific properties, um, and that reached 20 million readers alone. So that was a very exciting uh, piece of content coming out of the trip, and we were really um, delighted to see how that kind of built that brand awareness piece while also connecting it back to the beauty of New Zealand and the unique environment. Uh, and ultimately, uh, those additional recipes and articles have uh, generated 37 more placements, um, all reinforcing that New, New Zealand origin story um, and our key product attributes and, and really driving home why, you know, the differentiators that we're trying to bring to the marketplace and, and what uh, we can offer our conscious foodies. And one of the key metrics from the trip, uh, aside from providing a wonderful experience uh, that generated positive feedback was also driving positive sentiment uh, toward grass fed beef and lamb. Um, you can see from this very small selection of feedback that we made an overwhelmingly positive impact. Um, they walked away with an understanding and appreciation for you know, the, what the farmers are doing every day, the work you're putting in, um, your care for the animals, all things that we don't really see here in the US. Um, and so they, they walked away understanding that and again, sharing it with their audiences and their followers at home here in the US. So now, as I mentioned, uh, we're focusing on some of our most recent work um, and we'll dive into some activity highlights from the first half of this year. So we kicked things off with a bang uh, leading up to the Super Bowl, which here in the US is that first week of January. And we worked with chef George Duran to highlight New Zealand uh, grass-fed lamb in a segment on Good Morning America, which is one of the top national morning shows here in the US. Um, he created a lamb nachos recipe because we love uh, nachos and game day food. And he was able to create that recipe on air using uh, grass-fed lamb. Uh, it was also sampled by the host and the talent for the show um, with very enthusiastic, enthusiastic feedback um, and reached millions of consumers across the country online and on social. Um, following that success, we were able to do a second segment with George uh, in March and we were able to promote the Atkins Ranch lamb brand. In April, uh, we did an influencer program uh, tied to Earth Day. Uh, you know, last year, Whole Foods listed regenerative agriculture as one of the top food trends for 2020. Um, and as Rick kind of alluded to in his uh, insights previously, um, we've seen over time that conscious foodies are really starting to care more about where their food is coming from, the quality of the product, um, how those animals are raised, including, you know, no antibiotics, no GMOs. Um, so all things that really support our New Zealand farming story. Um, so we used uh, Earth Day as an opportunity to tell that story because luckily we are in a position to have a very uh, positive point of view there. Um, and that laid the foundation for some work that I will talk about a little bit later that we have coming up in the year. Um, so for this program, the social media influencers shared some key facts and figures. Um, they shared some very beautiful uh, imagery of, of farms and animals and farmers, um, all generating more than 7,000 engagements um, in just a very short window of time. Um, obviously, Earth Day is a one day uh, event, but it's something that we're trying to permeate uh, 365 days a year. And, and this really helped start that conversation and created an opportunity for us to be a part of the narrative. And then in the lead up to the Memorial Day holiday uh, here in the US, uh, which we unofficially call the start of summer grilling season, uh, we participated in a summer recipe roundup. Um, this is themed editorial content that goes out to consumers uh, online and in print, um, think your local newspaper or uh, even your local magazine um, and provides seasonal recipe inspiration. Uh, we featured a New Zealand grass-fed beef slider recipe, which you can see from the placement map in the middle of the slide has has been very well received and we've seen very strong pickup from this. Um, so again, just really connecting back to that grass-fed beef opportunity here in the US. 
We've also been working very closely with the Silver Fern Farms team uh, to support their retail range availability on the East Coast, uh, specifically New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. Uh, and we partnered with influencers to create content and recipes that featured uh, their grass-fed lamb cuts. Uh, so that included lamb medallions, uh, premium ground, and lamb steaks. And this content just started going live this month and so far has driven some very strong engagement and positive feedback, um, as well as provided that additional mealtime inspiration that we know consumers are looking for. Um, we have a few more posts coming up this week and we're excited to see how this performs. And now uh, I'll try to build on uh, what Rick talked about for COVID-19 and the impact we've seen here in the US, uh, both in the industry and for our consumers. Um, so as Rick mentioned, um, this is something that we don't see going away. And especially here in the US, we are very much uh, in the midst of this. So we have had to uh, pivot and make quite a few changes. Um, but we've also seen a lot of change in consumers behavior coming out of this. Um, one of the biggest ones being a significant spike in online grocery shopping um, and that strong trial and adoption for apps like Instacart um, and Shipt that really uh, drove home the convenience factor of having uh, groceries delivered to home. Um, and this particular behavior is one that's expected to continue well past COVID-19, whenever the end of that may be, um, simply because you know one of the biggest hurdles is, is trial. And this certainly uh, caused people to uh, give it a shot and it, it's been working well. Um, and then as Rick mentioned, that decline in food service and uh, you know, the closure of all the restaurants has led to increased meal consumption at home. Um, traditionally in the US, uh, consumers are not eating three meals a day at home, um, but that has changed uh, almost as a forcing function. And so with that has come uh, increased demand for meat at retail, uh, along with rising prices. Um, and then on the flip side of that, in, in the factories here, um, you know, there have been a lot of outbreaks in meatpacking and processing plants. Um, those are certainly making lots of headlines. And there's ultimately been supply chain disruption. So uh, this has all been very cyclical, but um, something that we're continuing to adapt and, and evolve around. Um, and with that, I can talk about how we've uh, had to pivot or shift our approach and our activity. Jumping to the next slide. Um, so we haven't shifted everything, but there's definitely been programming elements where we've had to be nimble and, and make some quick decisions to make sure that we're still relevant and providing helpful resources for our conscious foodies. Um, so this included moving away from entertaining and celebrations focused content um, to really talking more about, you know, time at home spent with your family or small gatherings. Um, and that, that carried through in our recipes, that editorial content I talked about, as well as our social media posts. Uh, we wanna be relevant and helpful, and we wanna make sure we're representative of what's happening in the world today. Um, and with that increased uh, usage of applications, we really have leaned into e-commerce solutions like Instacart and even Amazon Prime for Whole Foods delivery. Um, this is something we've highlighted in our partner programs as well as on social. And then we've also had to shift just to make sure that the work we're doing uh, can connect to product availability at retail because you know, our big goal is to make sure that we're out there pushing the product and the brands and giving people a place to buy it. Um, and we wanna make sure all those connection points are there for the work we're doing. And then really setting the stage for that sustainability story, I'd say that would be uh, one of the silver linings for this uh, program has been the ability to focus uh, additional efforts there. Um, and that's something we will continue to do uh, in the months and, and years ahead is just highlight that story in our difference. Jumping to the next slide. Uh, Sorry, one back for on the horizon uh, in the year ahead. Uh, just a couple of uh, exciting activities that we have coming up um, to support that sustainable farming story. We are in the process of updating our US website with some new messaging. Um, and next week we'll be distributing the findings from a survey of 2000 Americans on becoming a more conscious consumer. Um, so that'll actually talk about some of the things uh, Rick mentioned in terms of you know, uh, product sustainability, sourcing, how important some of those labels are. Um, so we're excited to bring that to market. Um, we're also building on that relationship that we've developed with our fam trip attendees, uh, you know, and, and building on that uh, brand connection that we've already established with them and working with them to create uh, more recipes and content 
Um, We'll also be connecting with more food influencers on social media because we know that um, social, particularly Instagram and Facebook, are huge drivers of uh, inspiration and information for consumers. So we want to continue to make sure that we are showing up there for them. Um, additional recipes, content. Um, we're also planning to work with some chefs here in the U.S. to uh, just provide a, an additional third party uh, expert or credibility lens on the work that we're doing um, to help drive that preference and also grow our library of recipes. And then in the next couple of months, we also have some great work coming up with Silver Fern Farms and Mark's Foods, uh, which is a great example of um, someone who's had to pivot their business for COVID-19. Uh, they traditionally were a meat wholesaler providing uh, primarily to restaurants and they've shifted their approach to become an e-commerce solution for consumers. Um, so that's a, a great example of kind of adapting and uh, working to fix a problem in the industry. And all that to say that uh, in addition to the communications program we have, we're also constantly monitoring and, and tracking the general impact of the work we're doing and that, that overall Taste Pure Nature campaign. Uh, the great news is that we're seeing uh, traction and we've uh, seen that the campaign is effective across all of our key metrics. Uh, and it's really doing the work of driving that positive perception of grass-fed beef and lamb from New Zealand. Um, so what this really means is that consumer appetite is strong for our product and, and that's great news for all of us. Now I can open it up to questions, Leanne. Perfect, thank you so much. That's great, Carrie. Um, well, firstly, hopefully people have eaten lunch because um, looking at all those delicious images, um, <laughs> yeah, it's quite it's quite tricky, isn't it? Um, yes. Yeah, when you're working in food, everything looks amazing. You're always hungry. Um, and then right. that, that fam trip looked amazing as well. I mean, I was yes. quite jealous because I heard all about the itinerary and all the amazing experiences that those people had. And it was so great to see them talk about those when they came back. So um, amazing. Well done. Um, so a couple questions here. So the first one is um, the Taste Pure Nature campaign seems to be heavily focused on digital and social media. Can you explain a little bit why that is? Sure. Um, so we know, uh, especially here in the US, and I think what Mike will has likely uh, discovered in China, uh, digital channels are kind of our bread and butter. We know that consumers are spending the bulk of their time online. Um, they are going to websites, they are on social media, and that has been um, further amplified with COVID. Uh, the digital content consumption uh, spikes over the past three months have been huge. Um, so ag again, we just wanna be where we know our consumers are and we wanna give them the resources and content where they're spending their time. And for us, that's digital. Perfect. And what cuts of beef and lamb are most popular in the US? Uh, for beef, I'd say because we have a little more familiar, famili we're more familiar with the product here. Um, those traditional, you know, what they might find in a steakhouse as well as grind, um, knowing that grilling is huge here. Um, for lamb, I, we kind of see different factors at retail, um, especially around COVID, ground lamb saw some huge spikes. Again, uh, it's kind of that ease of trial and, you know, uh, I think people are more willing to adopt that if they aren't familiar with it. Um, but then, you know, the cuts like, uh, racks as well as lamb loins. Um, it just depends on the markets. And we've we've tried to encourage uh, our influencers to promote recipes and content that feature a variety of cuts so that we can get people to drive uh, and support the, the overall category. Great. Um, a question here, which um, Mike might wanna jump in as well. What percentage of the market are made up of conscious foodies who can afford higher cost cuts of meat? Is this big enough to support supply from New Zealand and others? Uh, I mean, I can just jump in here. Absolutely. Um, we've done a global segmentation study that identified about 30, roughly 30% of the um, total population in the US classed as conscious foodie consumers. <clears throat> uh, the number's perhaps slightly high, but you know, if we take that as a sort of a foundational figure, there's plenty of opportunity. Um, there's plenty of conscious foodie consumers that could consume you know, all of the supply that we can take in or put into that market. So. Uh, there is significant opportunity, uh, as you know, both both the speakers have alluded to, uh, for New Zealand beef uh, and also New Zealand lamb, with the target consumer segment of the conscious foodie that you know is made up of um, people with multiple ethnicities, and so that's why we're seeing you know a range of cuts and product formats being consumed by this segment, um, and so again, it just bodes or adds to the to the opportunity for New Zealand both across um, beef and lamb proteins. 
Great. Absolutely. And I think we've got time for one more question here. How do you manage the pushback from vegans and animal activists in the US about consuming red meat? Because Carrie, we get a lot of discussion happening here in New Zealand. So, um, and I know this obviously plays out in the US as well. So have, how have you seen that playing out and what have you guys been doing, if anything, around that? You know, we, we actually talked about this on a call uh, last week. You know, we know that it's it's not for everyone. And while we welcome, you know, the different points of view, we also appreciate that a lot of people are trying to find that balance. And that does include grass-fed meat, while it might also include plant proteins. Um, so I think we're ultimately just looking to provide options and quality options for consumers who do want that product and who are uh, interested in, you know, if they're going to eat meat, they want it to be higher quality and they want it to taste great. And they want to know that, you know, that animal welfare piece is, is very important. So, you know, leaning into how much uh, care and attention and quality goes into um, farming and the raising of these animals is something we try to speak to as well. Great. Great. Okay. Well, that's all the time we have for Carrie for now. Um, again, if we have a few minutes towards the end, we'll bring her back to answer some more questions. So last but not least, we have Michael Wan, Global Manager in New Zealand Red Meat Story at Beef and Lamb New Zealand, joining us from Christchurch. Michael is an internationally experienced, commercially driven marketer. And over the past 17 years, he's been building brands for transformational growth. He's held senior roles with Sinlay Milk, Hawks Bay Tourism, New Zealand Post, Public Trust, and Cigna Insurance. In a moment, Michael will talk us through how we've launched Taste Pure Nature in China and how we're building the brand in partnership with New Zealand exporters and what some of those silver linings might be to the red meat story in light of COVID-19. Again, those silver linings. And Mike, like Rick, enjoys being active in his spare time. And I'm pretty sure I recall a race that they were both competing in. So you'll have to ask them who won. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to you, Mike. Thanks, Lahan. Uh, I don't think there's any competition between me and Rick. There's only, there's only one, one champion. Um, Next slide, please. I'm going to start with this quote uh, because I think it you know, really reflects the importance of working together as a sector uh, or as an export sector. And it also demonstrates the impact uh, we each have on our overall success. And what it's really saying is the positive perception of grass fed beef and lamb from New Zealand really helps uh, our brands grow. And the experience consumers have with those brands uh, helps reinforce the positive perception that. Uh, people have of New Zealand as an origin for those particular products. So I really like this quote and, and it's, it's just good to use it to set the context. Uh, I just want to go back a couple of steps just to, to make sure that um, we're all across the strategic uh, and agile approach we take to market development. What we do know is that origin plays a critically important role in the pathway to purchase for consumers. You know, acts as a shortcut to understanding and to trust building when consumers ask, you know, where does my food come from? And so our overall activation approach uh, in all markets has essentially two work streams. Now, they're not mutually exclusive, they are integrated, but there are two work streams. So uh, we do try and prioritize our investment in Taste Pure Nature at a strategic level, really to establish and drive both awareness and consideration for grass-fed beef and lamb from New Zealand. And we know from research, and Rick's mentioned it as well, that consumer knowledge and understanding of uh, New Zealand as a beef and, and lamb producing nation, let alone how we do it, is quite weak. And so we do invest um, a lot of time and energy, as Carrie's uh, outlined just now, in setting that strategic platform that really then enables us to partner with companies like ANSCO or Silverfern or whoever it might be, to create campaigns that really promote branded uh, beef or lamb product that's available at specific retail uh, retailers uh, and supports sales conversion. So they work together um, and it's really important to have that New Zealand uh, foundation established before we start to really leverage that uh, to drive sales conversion with particular brands. So China, well, um, the other guys have mentioned changing consumer buying habits and we're seeing the same thing in China. Uh, in the wake of COVID-19. And it's really opening up opportunities for New Zealand to make its presence felt in that market. Uh, consumers are seeking out healthy, nutritious food uh, to boost their immunity. And they're also seeking inspiration and ideas, whether it's around recipes or education uh, on how to cook successfully uh, while isolating at home. And so now is a real opportunity for New Zealand 
in our grass feed story, given its relevance to those value drivers that consumers in this market have right now. Uh, we're also seeing significant growth in online purchasing uh, during the COVID-19 outbreak, and it's largely driven by the convenience uh, or basically consumers being incentivized to buy online or shop online because they're you know, unable to actually practically visit a store, a physical store. Uh, and we do believe that there will be a level of permanency to this buying behavior post COVID-19, not only in China, but also in the US as well as Carrie's mentioned. Next slide. Uh, online mobile engagement in China uh, shows no sign of slowing. And it's mainly driven by the proliferation of mobile devices or smart devices, the digitization of the offline retail industry, as well as the popularity uh, of live streaming um, and its integration with social uh, shopping, music, and video platforms. Look, China is one of those um, countries that has skipped a generation of, of home computer use or PC computer use and just jumped straight into uh, mobile connectivity. Uh, and that's really what's driving interaction, uh, both from a marketing point of view and sales engagement uh, in that particular country. Next slide. Yeah, so mobile users on average spend about six hours every day online. Uh, pretty hard to believe, but, but they do. That's almost two full days a week uh, and almost twice as much as the average adult in the US spends <clears throat> on mobile devices online. Next slide. And the vast majority of consumers are really happy to make purchases using their mobile devices. You know, I know personally, it's, it, it's, you know, when it was first introduced here in New Zealand, it took some time to feel a level of comfort uh, around buying online, even on a home PC, let alone a mobile device. But, you know, Chinese consumers have just jumped on it uh, and, you know, the overwhelming majority are happy to purchase using their mobile phones. More than half of all these online users in China prefer to share everything they do online. You know, that's pretty amazing, right? Um, you know, I think people using in the Western world, Facebook come and go and you kind of get a bit sick of it, but you know, more than half of the population really want to share and engage um, uh, their personal life with others on, online. So what I'm trying to do with these, these slides is really just set the context uh, for the way we're approaching the Chinese market. Uh, and the reason that so much of our focus will be initially directed towards building our brand in a digital environment. So we're not as advanced in China as we are in the US, um, but we did launch a pilot program uh, in January of this year in collaboration with Ansco, Silver Fern Farms and Greenlee, and their in-market partner in the Shandong province. And this was a retail pilot where we created a in-store point of sale experience using the Taste Pre Nature Origin brand and some key messaging that we had uh, tested with consumers prior to launching. And so we basically put this uh, point of sale program into three retail channels, uh, two high-end butcher stores and a uh, high-end supermarket. Each of these stores were hand-picked, so there's about 15 to 20 initially. Uh, and the trial was really designed to see if uh, this branded experience would have an impact on sales and purchase conversion uh, in the lead up to and during Chinese New Year, which is a key buying period for red meat in China. Unfortunately, COVID-19 uh, had a bit of an impact on this particular pilot program. However, the silver lining has been uh, the fact that the uh, owner of the um, high-end supermarket has approached since approached us and said, look, love what we're doing and wants to roll it out, or is currently rolling out actually in more than 200 supermarket stores in that Shandong province. So, uh, I mean, that's a fantastic opportunity for us that we've um, grasped with both hands. Here's just an example of what that retail fit out uh, looked like. And you can see how the uh, origin brand and the origin experience starts to create that foundation for uh, New Zealand meat export company branded product to really, really flourish within that environment. We've also been working with Kevin Liu, who uh, is based in Shanghai. He's got his own cooking school uh, and um, retail outlet in Shanghai, uh, and he's increasingly using his online retail channels uh, and connections through there uh, in terms of online shopping to not only utilize Taste Pure Nature as a way to set that platform, but 
but create new communities of people uh, around um, New Zealand beef and lamb and ultimately to have them buy the product. One of the things Kevin's really hot on is live streaming and that's something we've seen uh, significantly increase over the last uh, 12 months in particular in China. So uh, a recent event that, that Kevin held was uh, back in April where he leveraged the Taste Pure Nature brand to really prove uh, the genuine nature of the products he was showcasing and to leverage the origin story as he communicated uh, not only the product attributes but the source of the product and where it came from. Uh, he had over a thousand viewers in this particular live stream uh, and you know, he also included a chef and a health coach uh, as part of the, the group that he, he used to showcase um, the actual product offering. The next slide shows you uh, just how it took place. It's quite sophisticated. He's well set up. <clears throat> and the next slide just shows you how up close and personal he's demonstrating to his uh, group of um, live stream followers, uh, not only the product itself, uh, verification of, of documents, but also brand branded product. And this happens to be um, Ansco product being showcased. So Rick should be happy. Next slide is just a couple more examples there uh, of what he's doing in Shanghai. So that's a quite a successful exercise. And from our perspective, Kevin's someone we will continue to partner with and work alongside to keep the integration of the Taste Pure Nature story and to provide resources and support to help grow not only the live streaming business, but as retail, uh, online retail business uh, and the cooking school program as well. Next slide. More recently, we've partnered with uh, Alliance Group uh, on the development of an integrated promotion, promotional program or campaign utilizing Taste Pure Nature and Pure South brands online. The objective is being obviously to, to create brand awareness and consideration for New Zealand beef and lamb and to drive uh, you know, I guess transitional pivot that, that preference uh, into sales conversion for Pure South via their online e-commerce channels. So again, another digital experience, a digital focus. And this particular program will run, uh, what's already running, uh, will continue to build and run right through to the end of the year. You can just see from the examples there on the right, uh, just how we've started to integrate uh, the use of Taste Pure Nature, that happens to be the brand mark. Uh, but storylines, messaging, uh, more visuals, all that kind of stuff uh, is being worked on at the moment and will be integrated into this campaign. Next slide. So what are we working on now? I mean, the key focus, as I mentioned at the outset, is developing that strategic foundation. And so uh, we've partnered with a Shanghai-based digital marketing agency uh, to help us develop that um, digital marketing strategy and activation plan, really, again, to drive home um, and will establish the benefits of New Zealand's credibility for grass-fed beef and lamb to educate consumers on the benefits uh, and convert that interest into purchase <clears throat> through either online or offline uh, retail sales uh, channels. We'll continue to uh, work on that program activity with um, Alliance and as Rick alluded to, we're, look, we're working with uh, ANSCO and uh, a number of other New Zealand meat export companies on the development of uh, those agile partnerships uh, where we'll be looking to really utilize Taste Pure Nature and the product brand to drive uh, increased sales through retail stores, be it off, offline or online. So that's what's coming up. Um, it's really exciting. And look, you know, I, I you know, agree with Rick, China provides a fantastic opportunity uh, for New Zealand beef and lamb. Um, and there's a window right now to get the grass fed story in there and to meet those uh, value drivers that we're seeing consumers uh, really start to gravitate towards. So with that, I'll open up to questions. And I actually think we've run short on time, but thank you, Mike, that was fantastic. Um, I know there's a couple of questions that have come through um, and I will find a way to actually come back and respond um, to everyone on those. So I just encourage you to put it in the chat um, or you can contact us and I'll have the email address in just a second. Um, yeah, really, really great stuff. Thank you so much, Rick and Carrie and Mike for those insightful presentations. And for everyone who's taken time out of their busy schedules to join us or to listen to us, um, keep an eye out for a note. We'll, we're, we'll send out a link to recording of the session. Please keep your questions and comments coming through. There was some great stuff around how can farmers further support Taste Pure Nature and have we thought about launching this domestically? So um, yeah, we definitely wanna get back to you all on those. 
Uh, keep an eye out for the next update as part of the Beef and Lamb New Zealand National Webinar Series. We're providing regular updates on work that's happening across the sector. And our next update is likely to be focused on trade. So if you have any suggestions or topics that you'd like to hear, just drop us a line in the chat or send it to events at beeflamnz.com. We definitely want your input. So thank you everyone for tuning in and take care. Matua. Bye.